Hey everyone, thanks for having me. My name is Danny. I am a technical educator at Web3 Foundation and today I'd love to talk a bit about what it means to build on Polkadot um, and hopefully touch on a bunch of topics related to Polkadot and building. So in the presentation, I'll, I will assume that you have some knowledge about Polkadot and Substrate based on the other talks that have taken place at the meetups, but by all means, if anything is unclear, we can definitely um, clear it up. So this is perhaps the Web3 slash Polkadot vision um, summed up. We believe in a decentralized and fair internet where users control their own data identity and destiny. But really, building on Polkadot means building for a multi-chain future. This is a core pillar of the Polkadot vision and what the ecosystem is hopefully trying to achieve. Um, basically building software that acknowledges and accepts and wants to participate in a multi-chain future. Polkadot allows a diverse set of chains to work in collaboration with each other, better known as interoperate, in a trustless and frictionless manner. Um, so formally speaking, Polkadot is a heterogeneous multi-chain that connects and secures blockchains um, with full security in, and interoperability. But let's try to break that down a bit. The way Polkadot achieves interoperability is by connecting a bunch of different specialized chains to a main chain that basically mitigates state transitions. Um, and this main chain that sits at the heart of the Polkadot protocol is known as the relay chain. The relay chain is really just meant to relay information and act as the distributed ledger that posts the final receipts of transactions um, that, have been taken, that have taken place on chain. But more specifically, Polkadot is a sharded blockchain protocol where each shard is a specialized chain, but even more so where each shard is a self-sovereign chain with its own set of rules. And because of this design, we can consider Polkadot to be a foundational layer of the decentralized web, also known as a layer zero. Then with each shard that connects to the relay chain, that's actually, this is actually a layer one blockchain. So we essentially have shards with their own protocols um, that co collectively make up Polkadot. And this starts to illustrate Polkadot basically being a blockchain of blockchains. Um, and we will come back to this idea soon. And not Polkadot just being a blockchain um, itself, but more like of the ecosystem of blockchains. And in Polkadot, we call these shards parachains. And I'm sure if you're familiar with, so, so you know, some, I would say, activity going on in the ecosystem, then this concept is relatively familiar to you. And the term parachain is just short for paralyzable chains, as each shard is able to operate in parallel. So one way to think about the idea of building on Polkadot is to actually build a parachain. Um, the idea of building a parachain is that a developer is going one layer lower, perhaps, than what they might do in, term, in terms of traditional um, approaches to application development on a layer one to implement specialized logic and create an app specific chain that allows for more functionality and usability that perhaps is impossible um, when trying to build an application on a traditional smart contract platform where a developer is basically constrained um, to a specific set of standards and primitives that act as a one size fits all method. Um, and we'll also break this down later in the presentation. So just to give a bit more background, Polkadot, like many other chains, uses proof of stake as its consensus mechanism, but a modified um, and hopefully better version of uh, proof of stake known as nominated proof of stake. So the maintainers of the network that validate transactions and reach consensus known as validators are elected based on nominations by nominators and not just by the stake um, that they're putting up on the network to back the network. There's of course more that happens behind the scenes, but that is the uh, general idea. So, okay, this all may sound interesting, maybe a little intriguing, but as a builder, what should you expect in terms of transactions? Why would, you know, Polkadot be attractive to you? Um, and how are things actually being executed? And you know, how do things all come together? So it's good to keep in mind that Polkadot has sharded architecture. And the neat thing about Polkadot is that a pair chain can actually offload its consensus to the relay chain. Um, and the relay chain guarantees finality. What that means is that the pair chain doesn't need its own set of validators to validate transactions. Um, this is actually accomplished by the validators on the relay chain. 
And for a builder, the builder can, you know, really focus on what they want to focus on without worrying about all these extra pain points when it comes to creating a chain. Um, and, you know, what sort of the consequences might be if they can't really figure out things after the fact um, that they've built this chain, um, but, you know, can't really get things up and running, can't build a community and so on. And this means that the pair chain can also just worry about its own block production and, you know, do what the chain does really well. And to sort of complement that, the relay chain isn't concerned with what happens on individual pair chains that's left to the pair chain. But to aggregate this data from the pair chain to the validators on the relay chain, a network participant known as a correlator acts as a network maintainer, um, similar to how miners do on proof of work chains. To be clear, correlators themselves aren't securing the network, the validators on the relay chain are with their stake and through the nominated proof of stake mechanism. Correlators will actually run a full node for both the pair chain and the relay chain, giving them all the necessary info to be able to produce block candidates and state transition proofs and execute transactions. In the pair chain model, the pair chain can control how blocks are authored and by whom, and they have their own state. So this is actually different from how sharding would work on, let's say, Ethereum, for instance, um, where each Ethereum shard has the same state transition function. This is because shards on Polkadot form a meta protocol, and to be specific, a wasm based meta protocol, giving us this design of Polkadot essentially being a protocol of protocols. Whereas Ethereum based shards would be fixed function, all with the same state transition function. The relay chain then accumulates the Canada blocks of all the pair chains or another way to think about it, all the wasm based protocols and attempts to reach finality. So essentially, all the states that are in parallel on the network come together into one final state, almost like a state of states. So all the blocks from the pair chains form a relay chain block. The relay chain block is produced by validators who validate the proofs passed on by the correlators and by participating in consensus with other validators. Now imagine, if for whatever reason a transaction um, or something needs to be reverted on a pair chain, um, the case would be that all the pair chains would have to revert at that point in time, not just the individual pair chain, because of this sharded architecture. And hopefully, this construct will show a builder that Polka has this more secure model and this almost like this shared security model. Um, and as a builder, hopefully you see the benefit of this execution model and how this model is made to fit applications um, that can scale. So we started off going down the Polkadot rabbit hole a bit. Why don't we step back and touch on some of the key concepts we just went over. So as a builder, building on Polkadot means you're building for an ecosystem that connects networks together, this multi-chain future. One that handles heavy traffic at scale, one that offers a sound security model, one that enables custom made platform specific use cases, and one that revolutionizes governance and decision making and allows for seamless upgrades. On the topic of governance and upgrades, we will see how this looks when comparing smart contracts to pair chains. The other sort of key takeaways, I hope that going through the path of a pair chain block um, made, th made, made those a bit clear. So now a bit on substrate um, and how the suits sort of fit together. So as you might be aware, Polkadot is built using substrate, which is a blockchain framework designed to make building um, blockchains easier, faster, cheaper, and safer. Substrate tries to abstract all the like nitty gritty that comes with blockchain development and allows a developer to focus on their application. Now bouncing off of the previous talk that took place during the meetup, we can use Substrate to build an application-specific chain that we can eventually turn into a pair chain on Polkadot. So the, I would say like the um, correct sort of terminology to go by in the Polkadot ecosystem is if you're building a layer one chain that aims to become a pair chain on Polkadot at some point, up until that point in time, it becomes a pair chain. It's technically, it's technically not a pair chain yet, but a pair chain candidate or simply just a chain in isolation. 
However, you can still use substrate to just build a blockchain without needing to connect to Polkadot. And that blockchain can be a solo chain and you know do its own thing. At the same time, you don't necessarily need to use Substrate to build a pair chain, but based on the implementation of Polkadot and the framework Substrate offers, it's almost like this natural path to use Substrate if you're aiming to develop a pair chain um, or an application for Polkadot. Because Substrate, or rather, Polkadot is um, a Wasm based protocol, um, really you can use any tool or, or like programming language that can be able that can be compiled into Wasm bytecode um, and understood by Polkadot because this is what the validators on the relay chain understand. So here are some projects um, in the Polkadot ecosystem that are built with Substrate and hopefully this puts into perspective the power and reach of the framework and also some of the possible use cases. According to parachains.info, which is quite the useful third-party website um, that presents information of projects in the Polkadot ecosystem, there are 162 projects currently in development. As a substrate developer, the most important thing to know is your runtime, as runtime keeps all the logic of your blockchain that gets exposed to users. To compose your runtime, you can take advantage of Frame, which is the framework with these different pieces that bring your blockchain to life. Frame is a collection of palettes. Um, you can also write your own palettes to extend Frame. And the neat thing about using Substrate to build is that you can take advantage of other custom logic available on other projects um, through their own custom palettes. And palettes can be easily combined in substrates, and each palette contains domain specific logic, um, which allows for certain functionalities to be added to a substrate based chain like Polkadot. And, you know, of course, through these palettes, builders can create chains with everything they need um, without sort of omitting pieces um, that they probably wouldn't need to omit if they're kind of. Um, sort of constrained to a certain set of standards and primitives um, if they weren't using the substrate um, approach and runtime developer approach to building uh, an application. So to build a parachain, you can actually use what's uh, known as a parachain development kit, PDK, which is similar to an SDK, but you know, in this case, it's for parachain development. A PDK is really just a set of tools that allows developers to create um, a pair chain, um, and in practice, it'll consist of two key components. One is a state transition function, so a blockchain, um, you know, being what a blockchain is, is essentially just a state machine, um, and this is a way um, for which the application um, moves to one state to another, and a correlator node, which we touched on earlier. So the state transition function can be an abstract way for your application to go from, let's say, state A to state B. And the correlator node is one of the types of network maintainers in the protocol who are responsible for keeping the availability of the state of the parachain and new states returned from the iteration of the state transition function. Correlators must also remain online to keep track of state and also cross-chain messages that um, it's for routes between itself and other parachains. So a PDK that exists right now uh, is called Cumulus, uh, which is basically an extension of Substrate that makes it easy um, to make any Substrate built runtime into a Polkadot compatible parachain. So when we say an extension, what we basically mean is just a library on Substrate for parachain development. And this PDK is still in development, but the idea is that you should, it should be simple to take any substrate based chain, add the parachain code by importing the crates, you know, in a single line of code to import the library, and then you have the necessary code um, to make a substrate based chain um, Polkadot compatible.
So while coming from, I would say, the perspective of why you would m maybe want to consider building a Polkadot and consider making a parachain, it's also good to consider how smart contracts kind of compare and fit into this. And hopefully this gives the better picture and more more consideration as a builder um, if you're, you know, considering to build on Polkadot and why perhaps the parachain model makes sense, but why it also might not make sense um, for building an application. So if we, let's say, break down the advantages and disadvantages of smart contracts. Uh, here we've listed some advantages of smart contracts under these themes, and we can expand on this. So smart contracts are trustful, they're transparent, reliable, accurate, and they have an aspect of automation to them. Um, so what that sort of looks like is that smart contracts, um, as we know, are immutable. Um, this ensures that no one can tamper with or break the contract. The contract also holds integrity and credibility at that point in time it was executed. And smart contracts allow us to take these centralized use cases in the real world and decentralize them. So examples of this, as I'm sure many of us have seen, is finance, governance, digital identity management, and you know many more. Now, when we consider the disadvantages of smart contract, we can actually point to what the Polkadot slash substrate architecture is almost partially a result from, as it's trying to address some of these disadvantages, um, the, as in the disadvantages of smart contract um, execution and building smart contracts. So let's we'll narrow these the disadvantages down to the themes of scalability, um, you know, general limitations and dependencies. Basically, traditional smart contracts can only exist on a single chain and wanting to execute the same contract on a different chain requires its own smart contract uh, to be deployed on that chain. It's also the fact that smart contracts are often too general for most use cases. Um, they're constrained by properties of their host chain and they are dependent on their ability to upgrade and must limit their own execution. So what this means is because the smart contract is resource dependent, the code that is being executed needs to use the resources of that chain's ecosystem. If there are aspects of the smart contract that are heavy on computational resources, this can obviously be problematic, um, resulting in something like a halting problem or be very economically expensive. And with a powerful language, it is impossible to know ahead of time whether or not a program will see execution. So some platforms address this through a very restricted scripting language such as Bitcoin. But other ecosystems will try to charge a fee or try to meter measure transactions, um, which is usually referred to as a gas fee. And that gives the rights to execute the code on the chain and use those computation resources. So, you know, the, I would say the most common example of this is on Ethereum. However, if a smart contract eventually um, executes indefinitely, um, it will cede its own execution by basically running out of gas. And limiting a smart contract's execution is also necessary to prevent um, DOS attacks. So even though we mentioned that an advantage of a smart contract or smart contracts is that they're immutable, this can actually very well be a disadvantage um, I, in, 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 this, in the way that they are immutable traditionally. Um, so if there's an update to be made in code within smart contract, that means an entirely new smart contract needs to be deployed that will be tied to an entirely new chain address. And then anything referring to the previous chain address also needs to be moved over to the new chain address. And when we consider this gas metered approach to measure transactions of a smart contract, transactions are metered each time they are executed. And I'm sure many builders are aware of the gas issue um, with this approach as an application can basically become the victim of its own success or the victim of some other application success. And it also seems a bit illogical um, if you, let's say, know the length and time of a transaction, but are metering it every single time which is subject to the consumption of resources on the chain at that point in time, whereas you can just agree on some weighted measurement 
for that specific transaction as you already know what the overall cost would be. So nicely enough, Polkadot doesn't use a gas metered model, um, but a weight fee model, meaning pair chains do not have a gas metered model in their logic. Pair chains can implement powerful programming languages um, and to sort of generalize these two ideas, um, pair chains try to be proactive whereas smart contracts are event driven. Okay, so sure, there are pain points with smart contracts, but let's say I have a smart contract I'm developing uh, that I developed. The next thing to do is to deploy it. There is a need for a target chain where the target chain has its own environments. With the pair chain model, using the pair chain, a developer can actually, you know, declare their own environment for their own chain. Pair chains can also upgrade themselves through on chain governance, allowing developers to update code. This is an essential pair chain feature to prevent forks, unlike smart contracts, which have exhaustive upgrading issues, as we've just touched on. And hopefully, this provides an argument as to why one, can, one would consider building a pair chain. Um, and it relates back to our topic of you know what it means to build on Polkadot. But still, there is a need to support smart contracts and build smart contracts, as smart contracts are definitely, uh, they definitely have a value proposition and can provide powerful pieces of software to create decentralized applications. There are parachain teams who have built logic to support EVM-based and WebAssembly-based um, or WASM-based smart contracts because there's a need to do so. Parity Technologies has also developed a uh, smart contract language um, called Inc, which is a Rust-based embedded domain-specific language for writing WASM smart contracts, specifically for the frame contracts palette. So while the parachain model is great, it might not be a viable solution for, let's say, existing applications or specific applications. Um, it might make sense to approach building on Polkadot by using the smart contract approach, but building on a layer one chain. Um, but with, with that comes the benefit, the added benefit of being able to take advantage of the Polkadot ecosystem and you know all the features of Polkadot, such as governance, um, interoperability, scalability, and so on, where contracts can communicate asynch asynchronously across different layer one chains, so across the pair chains, and syn synchronously within the, within the layer one chain that they're on or within the pair chain that they're on. So to put this into perspective, one of the pair chains on Polkadot now, Moonbeam, basically brings the EVM onto Polkadot, but it's not the only pair chain to do so. So let's say I have a dApp on Ethereum. I could probably just copy and paste um, the code of my dApp from Ethereum onto Moonbeam. And now I can take advantage of Moonbeam's platform. But even more so, I can, take I can take advantage of the benefits of the Polkadot ecosystem. If I'd like to build a new application on Polkadot, not as a pair chain, but you know, a simple dApp on a layer one through a smart contract approach, what might, be, what might be my approach? Um, so, you know, let's say I stick to EVM based smart contracts and there are these platforms as in these pair chains that are all EVM compatible. How would I know which one to choose as a builder? What would make sense to me? Well, the idea is that those layer ones themselves as in the pair chains are application specific chains um, and they could be general, um, but usually they're providing speci specific infrastructure for applications. So for instance, if I want to build a DeFi app, I might consider a pair chain that offers DeFi infrastructure. If I want to build a simple gaming application, I would probably consider a pair chain focused on gaming or a metaverse infrastructure. And the last thing to consider is the next generation uh, of smart contract development, which is often accepted to be WASM based smart contracts in the Polkadot ecosystem, as WASM allows developers to write code in any language that is that can be compiled into Wasm, you know, and simply run on the browser. Um, there's often a sentiment that Wasm-based contracts um, are the future um, to application development, with I would say a range of a range of benefits. Um, but the layer one pair chains on Polkadot 
uh, would also have supports for Watson based contracts the same way they would for EVM valuable contracts. So here's an example, or rather an illustration of upgradability on Polkadot, uh, which is facilitated by on-chain governance. Um, and this also um, should hopefully show the future-proof aspect um, of the Polkadot ecosystem. So as a builder, you know, you can build an application and in real time adapt to circumstances, changes, developments, discoveries that you can very seamlessly include in your application allowing your application to become future-proof and perhaps also relevant um, for the needs at that point in time. Just like how there are applications that should stay as smart contracts or be built as smart contracts, there are also layer one chains that probably wouldn't turn into a pair chain or go out of excuse me, go out of their way to create a pair chain to connect to Polkadot. And this is where bridging comes into play, bridging to other ecosystems. Another consideration of building on Polkadot can be also creating a bridge to connect to an existing blockchain platform. Let's say by using the bridge pa palettes um, with substrate or creating a bridge from one pair chain to another layer one chain by smart contracts or creating some high level protocol for chains that do not support smart contracts. Filling the toolbox. So everything in Polkadot has this low level encoding format, um, which makes it efficient to operate on, but not really friendly to build on. So you can imagine we're discussing building pair chains, we're discussing the ability to do all this let's say fancy stuff that you wouldn't be necessarily be able to do um, on a layer one chain that kind of limits you to a set of standards. But really what you're doing is you're going a bit lower in terms of programmability um, and you're becoming a runtime developer. Um, and while the low level encoding format in Polkadot makes it efficient to operate on, it's not really friendly to build on because of this. Um, there's a lack of human friendly and human readable information and resources, um, which prompts the need for middleware to act in between the blockchain and the application developers, uh, which is something being worked on, but there's still a need for more efforts to create good middleware and even just general tools for application developers. And then obviously when you have better tooling, now you have more users that can build better applications. Because there's still a gap um, between, let's say, what it means to use Substrate to build an application-specific chain, this is something that's perhaps one of the challenges in the Polkadot ecosystem. As a builder, um, that is a focus point um, for all builders um, to sort of consider contributing to um, to you know benefit the greater the greater application the greater community of application developers. And I would say at the same time comes the need for better UI and UX in the ecosystem. Um, and I would I would like to think that many would agree with me on this, um, as there's a ton of um, uh, areas and opportunity that could benefit from better UI and UX. Uh, despite the fact that there are many, many builders that um, focus on applications that offer good UI and better user experience, um, such as through like block explorers, user-friendly wallets. Um, but definitely there could, be, there could be more done and there's a need for more um, to be out there uh, in, within the ecosystem. And this is something to take into this is something to take into consideration where you don't necessarily need to build application specific logic on Polkadot or you need to build you know some some DAP, but rather you can build tooling um, and contribute to better UI um, for the ecosystem. 
And as an ecosystem, there is still a ways to go before applications are provided in a way like they are in Web2, where an end user um, is not really concerned with really what the application is built on, what's happening in the backend, what database it uses, or like how it runs. So as most of the Web3 space is working towards applications on the Polkadot ecosystem should also be presented in a way where an end user doesn't need to know um, that they're using or even interacting with the Polkadot blockchain. And the last thing I would want to point out when considering um, building on Polkadot is having the ambition and the confidence to build applications that go beyond DeFi. So while DeFi has tremendous benefits, there's also a need to build applications for all use cases. And as a potential builder, I would encourage, I would encourage you to uh, take that into serious consideration. Uh, and you know, many of these other applications would probably have a DeFi component to them or use DeFi products. Um, to some extent but i think the narrative of moving past DeFi um, means building for everything um, and hopefully the parachain model allows you to actually implement um, real life use cases um, whereas perhaps before um, with you know traditional ways of developing decentralized applications you're kind of limited to certain features and functionalities where sure you can create certain use cases but it's very general um, and if you've been in the space for some time DeFi applications obviously tend to take up most of what can be done on blockchain so this is also a need uh, to fill in the toolbox um, to have different types of applications And the last thing I wanted to mention was the funding opportunities to build on Polkadot. So at the Web3 Foundation, we actually offer a comprehensive grants program uh, that is focused on funding software development and research efforts related to Polkadot, um, Kusama, Substrate, and Inc. Many of the parachain teams have received a grant from Web3 Foundation, actually, uh, to some degree, um, as there are different levels of funding that a team can receive. Similarly, uh, there is a substrate builders program that Parity Technologies offers, and this is aimed to identify, support, and mentor current and potential substrate related projects. And this is split up into three tracks. So there is a change track, which focuses on projects building impactful chains, an infrastructure track, uh, which focuses on projects building substrate or polka dot related infrastructure, and an applications track, which focuses on building applications on top of substrate based chains like web3 foundation there are also grant programs offered by parachain teams so similar to how the web3 foundation grants program offers grants for building software um, and also research efforts for let's say polkadot and substrate the grants program on parachain teams will offer a grant to build on their pair chain and also custom logic, um, let's say with substrate um, and so on. And of course there is an on-chain treasury um, where users can submit a proposal for funding um, to Polkadot's governance system. But as a builder, perhaps a program that's available within the ecosystem um, would probably be the most, um, the most realistic uh, way of, of um, getting funding thank you very much for tuning in uh, we appreciate the interest and hopefully if there's continued interest we can um, consider exploring one or more of these topics we touched on in more detail thank you